church, and then there's the partner, uh, it's a Baptist community in Central Africa. They have about 134 churches, I think they got 70, uh, 170 some schools, um, 35 small medical centers in the immediate area, but as this Ebola, Ebola crisis has exploded, I mean, they're being overwhelmed, uh, but at the same time, it's amazing how the Lord works, that church community has uh, automatically been given a voice. People are looking to them for, uh, for help. And so there's a great opportunity to take advantage of and, uh, and uh, spread the love of Jesus as they serve these people. So anyways, there's been lots of stuff. I mean, I'm not going to read the whole letter to you, but there's been lots of civil problems there, civil unrest, civil wars. Um, there's been over a million displaced people uh, over the past uh, few years there. Um, thousands of people have been killed in the conflict in just three years. So, I mean, there's lots of issues there, but they've been now opened up. It's like, kind of like this Ebola crisis is kind of the last, final straw. And so many people, as I said, are turning to the church. So what they do need, though, there's a couple of needs. They need prayer, but they also need some money. And uh, so they're trying to raise $25,000 uh, quickly to equip 1,000 people. And what they're going to be doing is situating these people in about 100 communities. So that gives you kind of a broad picture that we're going to pray for. So if you want to be involved uh, in prayer, prayer for them, we're going to pray for them this morning, but I want them to be on your mind and to be praying for Tear Fund Canada as they are connecting out here in regards to this Congo issue and this crisis. And if you do want, you're interested in, uh, in um, donating some money to the cause, come and talk to me and I can show you or tell you how to uh, access um, uh, Tear Fund Canada. The other item to bring to your attention is something that's a little bit closer to home. Happened in Fredericton, and uh, there are four people killed. Uh, two people, they're still not sure why, two civilians rather, they're still not sure why they were killed. Could be some um, uh, domestic issue going on where people don't know. I don't know anyways. And uh, also two uh, police officers were killed. So four people killed in that situation. So whatever the case is, and for whatever the reason we don't know, it's terrible. But a couple of things. We need to be praying for those families that have been affected. And we also need to be praying for the churches. As the churches in the Congo are seizing on this opportunity, that they would seize on the opportunity to glorify Jesus Christ in that. People need hope. They need an answer. They're confused. They're, they're uncertain what's going on. But you know what? God has, is not surprised. He is never caught off guard. And, uh, and so we're asking for wisdom for these, uh, for these Christians within that community to serve Jesus in that way. So those are two things that we do want to be praying about. So let's go to prayer. Let's praise the Lord for how, he's, how he is uh, revealing himself to us. And let's... Uh, Thank him for that, but also let's lay these other issues before him too, knowing that he's in control. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God that we can always come to, that we can trust. You say that we can trust in you for eternal life. So if you're a God who, can, who we can trust for eternity, we can certainly trust you for today. And so these, uh, these issues in Congo, we pray that you would be so evident there that, in fact, it would cause a revival, that people would turn to you in mass, and that you would heal, that you would re restore, that you would redeem lives. So we pray for wisdom with Tear Fund. We pray for the issue, even in regards to raising funds, that you would grant them favor, and you would uh, uh, allow them to collect that quickly. Father, we pray for Fredericton, and, and uh, I know that there are churches there who uh, I'm, sure, I'm certain that some of them are affected even personally and directly. Uh, it's a small enough community. We pray for wisdom there, God, that they would um, see uh, and seize on those opportunities to be Jesus, to represent who you are in their hands and their feet during a time of crisis, and that it would not end there but it would continue on into the future as well, um, whether there's crisis or not. But Father, that Jesus would be glorified over Fredericton, just as we pray that he'd be glorified over Dartmouth, over Halifax, over Cole Harbor, over all of Nova Scotia. 
And so we lay these before the cross because there is nothing we can do as human beings, but you can do amazing work. Father, we want to thank you for how you do show up and how you are working in our lives. And we pray that you continue to change us, make us into that image of Jesus Christ as we represent the image of God in our community and that people would see that. And as a result, lives changed. So God, uh, we ask for you to speak this morning. We give you the crumbs that I even opened up and, and, um, and, and worked on this week, Father. And we pray that you would uh, multiply this in our lives. That it would be your words we hear. That we'd be challenged from what you have to say. And that we'd be encouraged to move on as disciples of Jesus Christ. And we pray this, Father, as we get ready and as we get set to answer for the hope that we have within us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a continuation of the sermon series of uh, Seeking God Over the Summer. And, uh, and again, uh, as we seek God over the summer, as we seek God at any time of our lives and of our days, uh, we're going to see God at work. And what's going to happen when we see God at work, though, we also need to be prepared to give an answer to those who do see God at work in our lives. Because that will happen. Now, it might not necessarily happen the way we might think, or even the way we might hope, but it will happen. Whether it's somebody that's walking up to a booth and muttering something as they walk by, and, and you take advantage of that and run after them, or whether it's somebody who comes up to you and actually asks you a direct question, we take advantage of that. But God, when he's at work, people are going to see him at work in our lives, and we need to be prepared to give an answer. A number of months ago, uh, some of you may recall, uh, the World Watch Monitor had reported that thousands of Christians had to flee the city of um, uh, Mosul. And uh, Mosul happens to be uh, a, uh, or was, the last stronghold of any Christian influence, or the main stronghold of, of uh, Christian influence in the country of, um, of Iraq. And this uh, Islamist terror group had come in and they were raping men and women and children. And they were killing men and women and children. And uh, mainly it was the Christians that they were targeting as their main target group. Though there were other fringe groups as well. Anybody that they deemed to be apostates of Islam, they targeted them. Now, I share that with you not to bring us down. I think it's good to be aware of what's going on in, around the world. And we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters around the globe and understand that. But the reason I was bringing this up is uh, certainly we're not facing persecution uh, like our brothers and sisters in Iraq. However, we are facing an increase of intolerance, I think, just the same. Just recently, uh, a pastor by the name of Greg Laurie, some of you may or may not know who he is, he pastors a large uh, organizational church uh, with a number of campuses out on the uh, west coast of the United States, specifically, mostly in California. Uh, he's well known, he's well respected, and by the way, if, if uh, you're interested, Greg Laurie does write some good books, and, and I would actually uh, recommend him. But I, was wa I, I noticed on the news about Greg Laurie just recently, he... Um, had, uh, they were doing an evangelistic campaign and he had put some posters or billboards up. And on the billboards they had a picture of basically him holding a black book. It didn't have any, any uh, signs on it, didn't have any logos on it. It was just a, uh, an outline of a black book and advertising this upcoming evangelistic event. But what happened was he had to remove those billboards and here's why. The community had received numerous uh, uh, complaints about this billboard, and in fact, they had even received a serious threat because they had the billboard up there, so they had to take the billboards down. That might not sound like a major thing, but it's one piece that we're beginning to see happen more and more and more. I call it the slippery slope. Closer to home in Canada, we as a nation have traditionally upheld uh, values of diversity for a broad array of religious views and non-religious views as well throughout the years. So it became extremely disappointing to me 
and troubling in the way the Supreme Court of Canada had made it, uh, come down on a decision regarding Trinity Western University's bid to um, um, become a, a law school. And so they, no law, they, they disallowed this opportunity for them because in their understanding as a court's interpretation rather, Trinity's Western's view of Christian marriage and, and uh, which is the traditional way of marriage was considered an unhealthy to democracy and, uh, and thus intolerable for a law school. So they were disallowed. Now, again, they might not sound like major persecution issues. However, I will say this. I believe they are slippery slopes towards our outright persecutions if they're not checked, if they don't stop. And I'm not solely sure that they're going to stop. I think we need to be asking a question, and if that's the case, I, I think we need to be asking a question about ourselves. Is it worth the trouble? Is it worth the trouble? I mean, does my faith mean enough to me uh, to put up with intolerances and persecutions if it comes to that? Does my faith make enough difference in my life that it actually matters one way or the other? I think we need to be asking that question about that. If that pulls me out of my comfort zone, is it worth it? Now, with Christianity, and I'm able to live a comfortable life, I can do that. But if I'm pulled out of that comfort zone, is it worth it? Why would it be worth it? If the Christian faith doesn't make a difference in our lives, if, if, if it doesn't give a better hope than anyone else in the world, why put up with the grief it brings? A grief, I believe, that's only going to certainly increase. And for that matter, it's a grief that we've been promised. Now turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be looking at that just for, for a few moments this morning. Hold your finger in there. We're going to be looking at uh, verses 13 to 16. But a little background before we actually get to that passage. Um, it, it was a time of very real trials when Peter wrote this epistle. There was a lot of persecutions happening, uh, not unlike what our brothers and sisters have been experiencing in Iraq this time. I mean, there were some of the first mutterings of what would become an awful storm about to break out uh, upon the um, Roman Empire under Nero's rule was about to happen. Uh, and, and so there were hints of that beginning already. In fact, already Christians were being thrown into prison. Um, some were actually being executed in public already by this point, simply for making the claim that Jesus was their Lord. So this was already happening. Understand that as Peter writes this letter. So the inten intention of this epistle then was to encourage these first century Christians, first generation Christians, in fact, in order that they might not be overwhelmed and to instruct them in how to respond with what to say. But even more importantly, to remind them of the hope that they did have within them. By the way, this hope that he was reminding them about superseded everything and anyone else the world could offer them in exchange. And so Peter wanted to reassure them that, yes, it was worth it. And it was worth it, church. And in fact, it was more than worth it to be counted as a disciple of Jesus Christ, no matter what persecutions they were about to face. And these words of his apply, by the way, not just to these first century Christians. They also apply to us today here in a place called Dartmouth. Yeah, right, applies to us here. And um, especially as our culture heads down the slippery slope away from God, we Christians need to know just why we believe what we do. Why do we believe it? And why the hope we have is so important. And why it's so valuable um, to us. And in fact understand that it is so valuable and so important to us that it's worth giving up our reputations and our freedoms and even our very lives, by the way, church, if it comes to it. Amen. So let's read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 16. And it is on the screen if you did not bring a Bible with you. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, we have some Bibles that you can grab on the way out if you want, and that we'd love you to have that as a gift from us. But 1 Peter rather, chapter 3, starting at verse 13. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So let's take a look at what this all means, to us specifically. Now, immediately, Peter asks an intriguing question here to introduce his discussion of the suffering which the readers are experiencing. Now, keep in mind that they're already being persecuted. This was happening, as, as I talked about. Many were dying, or at least were close to those who had been martyred for the faith. Everybody seemed to know somebody who had been affected. They were a small enough community that they would have known. It's kind of like Fredericton. Everybody kind of knows somebody who would know somebody, at least, within uh, that small sphere of influence of who had been hurt within this tragedy we just experienced or uh, observed. So it seems odd to ask a question that he asks. Now, who is there to harm you? Really, it almost sounds cruel, doesn't it? I mean, did Peter miss the memo? Like, what went on with Peter here? Was he one of those maybe callous spiritual leaders who was sitting back in his little ivory tower far away from the pain and suffering of, that his people were experiencing? And so he simply was throwing out some kind of nice-sounding platitude? Like, what was going on here? The truth is, what Peter was doing was he was asking a rhetorical question. Rhetorical questions, by the way, are, are questions generally used to stress particular points. We're, we're used to rhetorical questions, by the way. We use them all the time in our, in our conversations, such as, is the Pope Catholic? Or, is rain wet? You know, like, what's the simple answer to those? Yes. I mean, we already know that, but it's like stressing a point, uh, an assured yes. A resounding yes is what we mean by that. Peter was asking a rhetorical question to make a strong point. His readers would have heard the question like this maybe in their minds. Maybe it explains it a little better. He's saying, listen, since God is, uh, takes such good care of the righteous, who in the world could harm you? That's kind of what he was asking there. And they would have immediately heard the implied answer, as in any rhetorical question. Well, nobody. No one. It appears we have a problem then, I think, don't we? Really. Because the history of the church seems to prove that enemies of the gospel do harm faithful disciples. But instead of correcting what appears to be a mistake of communication, what does Peter do? Peter seems only to increase the seeming contradiction by implying, in verse 14, that suffering also brings blessing. So let's look at that for a moment. Suffering brings blessing. Yes, you're right. Absolutely does. What does he mean by that then? Now, at this point, you might really want to start accusing Peter of missing the memo. <laughs> All right? Okay, you really are out to lunch here. However, before we go accusing good old Peter of uh, missing what's really going on, let's take a look at verse 14 just a little more closely. So verse 14 says this, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake... You will be blessed. And he finishes off by saying, You have no fear of them, nor be troubled, or have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Now, I don't know about you. This is me now. But personally, I like the idea of being blessed. I really do. Amen. I say that all the time, too. Bless me. Amen. I think of all the good things that should be experienced. You know, things like peace, joy, success. Hey, God, bring me some health and bring me some wealth. Right? Bring me a little bit of that. I like that. We all do it. We all say it. I mean, we might not admit it sometimes, but I think we all do it. God has blessed me with a wonderful family. You might have heard that. Or we've been blessed here in this country with peace. Yeah, God, keep on blessing me. Bring it on. Keep it coming. And then you read a, something like this from Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, and he says this, and it messes my mind. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Huh. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, Jesus, where's that health and wealth thing again? Like, how come it's not in there? Like, really? And so that messes my mind. 
Why in the world would it be a blessing to be persecuted? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about that? Why would it be a blessing to be persecuted? I personally find it a huge inconvenience myself. But here we're told that we're going to be blessed when we're persecuted. Now get this, for Christ's sake, for righteousness. So, I then ask myself, could I actually say I want to be blessed? Do I want that blessing? Remember the question I asked at the beginning? Is it worth it if I knew that I was going to be persecuted? Do I want that blessing? The answer to the question, I think, hinges on where we expect our reward. Where do you expect your reward? Now, allow me to explain. Let me unpack that a little bit. Jesus gave an encouragement to the church at Smyrna. Smyrna, by the way, was a, was a city and a church was established there in, uh, in uh, Turkey in the first century. And he said to them in the book of Revelation to not fear what they're about to suffer. And he tells them that the devil is about to cast some of them into prison and that they were going to be tested. Okay? He then says in Revelation 2.10, and let me read this to you. Be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. So be faithful until you die, yeah, and then I give you a crown of life. The question begs to be asked, is it worth it? What's he talking about here? What's he promising here? Here we see that suffering is directly connected to receiving a spiritual blessing. In fact, he calls it a reward. The scriptures seem quite clear that if we live for Jesus and thus stand out as different from, uh, from the world, there will often, if not always, be some sort of a backlash of some kind. So, in other words, expect. Now, it might be a minor thing that may not affect you much, but it could also be a, a major life-altering backlash, i.e. death. But either way, he's saying, consider yourself blessed if you suffer persecution. Because though the persecution might hurt, it's only temporary, whereas the reward is eternal. Peter knows that it's, uh, by the way, that it's not a natural thing for us to do. It's not in our natures to do that. So, so he goes on to offer some practical guidelines. So let's go back to verse 14 for a second. And he says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. It helps us if we understand what Peter is. He's actually quoting something here. So I think it helps us to understand that. He's quoting from uh, the prophet Isaiah at this point. And the audience, by the way, at that time would have instantly understood what he was and recognized the story that he was referring to. What happened in Isaiah's day was that there was a king. His name was Ahaz. And... Uh, he was the king of Judah, and he was faced with this impending invasion by the powerful Assyrians. And uh, in addition, the kings of Israel, the, that was the northern uh, kingdom of the ten tribes of, of Israel, and Syria uh, wanted King Ahaz to join them in an alliance, and it's all these politics stuff going on. And so Ahaz's eyes were fixated on the politics of the day. He didn't have this vertical alignment with God. Ahaz wasn't a good king, by the way. And he had his focus, though, on the politics. And he had his focus on his own back and his own comfort level. And, uh, and what happened was that not only did he not focus on God, but he refused to join the, uh, the other ten tribes and, uh, and, uh, and, and side with them. And instead, um, he uh, allied himself with Assyria. And he did this, by the way, subtly, and he did it behind the back. So it was kind of like one of these situations where, you know what, he just was not making good of any situation. In fact, he was making a bad thing worse. Now, in this background, this happening, this going on, God's prophet Isaiah comes and he warns King Ahaz against any ungodly alliance. He says, it's not going to work. It's not good. And he urged him to trust in Jehovah for deliverance. And he was saying to him in Isaiah 8, he says, do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. He's saying, listen, get this vertical alignment going. Start coming back to God. Repent. Come to God. Believe in him and trust in him. In other words, he's saying to fear God alone. Don't fear the human armies that are coming to attack you. Don't fear all of the political systems around you. Instead, you need only to fear God. Unfortunately, King Ahaz, if you know the story, you can read it uh, yourself, King Ahaz succumbed to the fear of these armies, and he ended up losing absolutely everything. So what Peter's doing now, with that understanding, with that uh, story behind the scenes, Peter applies these words from Isaiah, and he says to us that we need to learn from history, and instead of fearing man, 
like Ahaz did, we need to be fearing God alone, especially given that we are blessed when we do fear God. And so he tells us to fear God alone. Now, what does that fearing God thing look like? Now, I remember as a kid getting a little bit of trouble. I know it's hard to believe that I got in trouble as a kid, but I did on occasion. Usually it was my brother lied about me. But I, I remember being deathly afraid of my dad and about the punishment I would go get from him. My dad, I loved him very much, so he's not a mean guy. But when I was in trouble, I was afraid of my dad. And, uh, and I had this fear. Now, when we hear the word fear in our English language, um, we're limited to our understanding of what that word means. And we think it means what I felt when expecting the back of my dad's hand. Ah, you know, that kind of thing. Duck and cover. <laughs> but in actuality, fear means, in this case, honor. In verse 15, Peter says this, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Honor Him. Fear Him. Now, the word but is a term to compare things, which begs, I think, the question, what was Peter comparing here when he says, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord is holy? Here he's saying that instead of fearing and being stirred up and agitated because of possible suffering, honor Christ the Lord in our hearts instead. Okay? Sounds simple, but it's something that we've got to put into practice. The term honor in your heart, by the way, to help us understand that a little bit better, to the Greek, would have painted a picture of, of uh, huge fans, massive amount of fans at an Olympic event cheering on their team, similar to honoring our hockey teams and how we cheer loudly for them and, and how we act out as diehard fans and uh, following them and supporting them no matter what, you know, uh, to glory or to the bitter end. There's a, 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 and there's an understanding of a deep emotional connection to them. If I'm not emotionally invested in something, now for me, it would be a football team more likely, and uh, as an example, it's hard for me, if not impossible for me, to get behind them. But if I'm emotionally connected to that team, boy, I, I'll tape their games, I'll watch their games, and if they lose, I get personally offended, you know, all those kinds of things. I know us sports people are crazy. But may, maybe you don't understand the sports analogy. Let me explain it maybe a different way. If you're emotionally committed to, uh, I, I, to maybe your child, I think most of you probably are committed to your child emotionally connected. So imagine that being uh, your connection to your child or maybe a, your, you as a child connected to an elderly parent. I mean, it, it is one thing to see another child or another person's parents suffer, and yeah, we care, but it's quite another thing when it's your own child or it's your mom or dad that need the care. See, if you're emotionally, here, here's the point. If you're emotionally committed to something, if you're a fan, if you're zealous, it'll affect your motivation. That's what you see when the center of your life is emotionally aligned with Jesus, you see. So imagine that. It's when he owns your heart at an emotional level, uh, at an emotional level are you then able to respond properly to the changes in the rough patches of your life, including times of persecution that might come your way? There's an emotional attachment, an emotional connection that goes deep. And that's what he's talking about in honoring him in your heart, that emotional attachment. So then how do we fear God? How do we honor Christ in our hearts? You know how you do that? You turn absolutely everything over to him. And you live only to please him and live to glorify him. It means we fear displeasing him Way more than fearing what my, men might say about us as his disciples, or what that might even, or what they might even do to us. And, and there's, there's evidences that we see then as a result of living that way. One evidence is that Christ is Lord in our lives is the readiness then in which we tell others about him. You can't help but share. Let's go back to the early church for a moment and help us put maybe this into context a little bit. In the early church, if a person stood up in a public arena and cried out, Jesus is God, no one would be offended. Do you know why? Because the Romans and the Greeks believed in many gods. That wasn't an issue to them. They, they had no problem with that. Do that all you want. But if a Christian stood up and said, Jesus is Lord, and there is no other, boom. He or she would be putting their own life at risk. And you know why? It was because the Caesars claimed the title of the Lord. And this was the central reason why Christians faced persecution and even death 
when they were standing up and, and, and declaring Jesus as Lord. That was a threat to Nero. That was a threat to any of the other Caesars. The strain, same struggle over ultimate lordship, by the way, explains much of the angst we even sense in our own culture today. I mean, spirituality is okay to talk about. In fact, you can even talk about God. That's okay. Make a truth claim that Jesus is Lord over our culture and his word directs our lives, however. Watch out. It's because we're declaring Jesus is Lord in that case. The real issue is the lordship of fear versus the lordship of Christ. Those who make Jesus Christ Lord do not need to fear what people do or say to them or about them. So now with that in mind, Peter goes on to say in verse 15 that we are then always to be prepared. What this means is that you should know what you believe and why you believe it. You need to be ready, willing, able to explain what you believe to somebody else. Now, I understand that if you're a brand new disciple in Jesus Christ, this is a journey and we're going to be growing together. But I'm saying this is where we aim to. We move towards this. Today, by the way, I don't know if any of you watch tennis, but today is the final match of the uh, Rogers Cup. And if you have been following it, it's sad to say that there are no Canadians left in the match. I think uh, uh, certainly in the men, possibly in the women too. Now, if you've followed any of the tennis matches or maybe you've played tennis, you'd know that good tennis players know how to be ready, whether it's for the serve or whether it's for the return of their serve. They, they, they need to be standing on the balls of their feet so they can react either way. Who here plays tennis? <laughs> Russell. I can always count on Russell. Russell and me. So, just so you know, be on the balls of your feet. They've got to be ready. That's why they're so quick. And, um, and so they are always getting prepared. And the better prepared they are, the better that they can play. So be prepared can easily be the tennis pro's motto. But it's actually the Boy Scouts motto. Be prepared means you're always in a state of readiness of mind and body to do your duty. That's what he's saying here. Be prepared. Peter must have been a Boy Scout or a tennis player, or maybe both, I don't know, because he says, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks of you. Same with Paul and Timothy, because Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy, be prepared. He must have been a Boy Scout too, right? uh, He says, be prepared to Timothy, whether the time's favorable or not. Being prepared, church, is an important part of living by faith. Believers need to be like the tennis player. We need to be like Boy Scouts. We need, we need to be prepared. We need to be fit. We need to be ready. That means you ought to know more than a little about the Bible. That means, uh, here, here's a tragedy of the hour, I think, is that there are so many folks who say they're Christians, but you, a skeptic can tie them up in 14 different knots like a little kitty caught up in a ball of yarn and they can't get out. And that, to me, is a tragedy. And again, I'm not talking about the person who's a brand new believer in Jesus Christ. If you've been a believer in Jesus Christ for more than a year, you should have enough knowledge to be able to get out at least of those seven of those knots. Okay? I think it's, we just don't know the Word of God enough. So we always need to be ready to give a defense. But to do that, we've got to know what we believe. We must have thought it out. We must be able to state it intelligently. That's why we study and, we, and why, by the way, we at LifeBridge offer opportunities for growth. Why we're having these missional communities being launched. Why we get together on a Sunday morning in a connection service and why we open up the Bible. And why we read it. Why we encourage you to read it yourself. Become a lifelong learner, church. Learn, learn, learn. Learn as much as we can about this hope that we have within us so that we can give an answer to anyone who asks. And as we do, Peter says, by the way, as you give this answer, here's, here's a practical instruction for you. Do it with gentleness and do it with respect. Just do that, people. Gentleness and respect. I mean, Peter knows human nature. He, he knows that there are many of us who state our beliefs with a kind of arrogant belligerence. Before I, uh, not many of you might not, but but I, I know before I matured as a believer uh, and understood better, there have been times with, when the Bible in my hand was, was not a sword, it was more of a club. Boom, right? Hit people over the head with it. And, uh, um, I, I, you know, I understood better as time went on, but in my younger days, anybody who disagreed with me must have been an idiot. 
right? It's like, you don't know what I know. And so I'd ram my beliefs down their throat. I'd be sitting on them almost, you know, like, believe what I believe and believe in Jesus, accept Jesus Christ. Well, the case for Christ, I have matured, by the way. I just put it out there. The case for Christ has to be presented with gentleness and it must be presented with respect and with love. Listen, you can't bully somebody into the faith. You can't. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Some of you may know that line. And that's so true with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember that we are witnesses. We're not prosecuting attorneys. That's not our job. So what happens is the outcome of treating others with respect and being gentle in approach is what Peter says in verse 16. And he goes on and he says, having a good conscience as a result, be, uh, so that when you are slandered, not if, when, when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So the idea is this, and the thought was this, as we go and share our story of redemption and, and, our, and a story of transformation in our lives, we're to approach it in such a way that we can walk away with a clear conscience in order that even if somebody slanders you for living for Jesus Christ, it brings them to shame. Here's what this means. Because think about this. How could anybody keep on slandering somebody for per, uh, or persecuting somebody who keeps speaking well of them and doing good things for them and, and, and for other people? It's like, I hate what they believe, but man, are they wonderful people. That's kind of the reputation we should be having. Especially when you're able to introduce at the same time this very real hope in their lives. Let's go back. I, I kind of jumped onto it, but I want to come back to it, back into verse 15 about this hope. He says this in, in, uh, uh, in the second part of verse 15, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. We've got to share the hope we have, church, because the world is starving for hope. Amen. So we've got to share it. We must share this hope. Now, just what is this hope? This hope is something that is better, much, much, much better than what the world could ever offer. That's why Peter is convinced that the persecution is worth it. It's important to understand that hope in Scripture, by the way, isn't the world's definition of hope's soul. So we have to understand it's not a cross your fingers and a cross your toes kind of hope. That's not the kind of hope he's talking about. Now, again, understanding where these people were coming from. In the ancient culture, um, the world didn't generally regard hope as a benefit. To them, it was a temporary illusion. In fact, historians tell us that, this, that there was this great cloud of hopelessness that covered the, the ancient world. Philosophies were empty. Traditions were disappearing. Religions were powerless to help people face either life or death. And i got to tell you, that sounds very similar to where we are today. Add to all that things like climate change today, which is scaring some people into panic. Wars, rumors of wars, uh, threats of terrorism, fears of financial collapse. So Peter comes along and being inspired by God uses a different definition of hope that messes up the minds of the early church and the people at that time. He says, listen, God's hope is not an illusion, people. It's actually the absolute certainty of a future good. You can now have a desire for some future good with the absolute expectation of obtaining it. Of, uh, you can expect a fulfillment of it. It's not some kind of Foo-foo dream out there. It's a reality. Solid. And Peter's saying that it's because of Jesus. And that's why we have this hope. You see, church, with Christ in our lives, it's no longer finger crossing hope, but is alive and certain because of the res resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, when we entered into the new life with Christ, we soon discovered that life without Christ was a hopeless end, whereas life in Christ Jesus is now an endless hope. Amen? Hebrews says this about hope. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Amen. And i got to tell you, that verse carries with it all the confidences that come with knowing for sure, uh, with no question, what we've been promised by God in His Word when we pick up that Bible and we can read it and we can know for certain. Our faith is confident assurance because it is founded on what Peter was pointing to, Jesus. As believers, that's the hope that's within us that we can answer to anybody who would ask of us. 
It's always pointing to Jesus. Biblical hope is a reality. It's not a feeling. Biblical hope carries no doubt. Biblical hope is a sure foundation in which we base our, our lives, believing that God always, 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 church, keeps His promises. That means then, church, that our hope or, or confident assurance can be ours when we trust the words of Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has everlasting hope. Not might have everlasting hope or life, but does have everlasting life. I think this is partly why Peter talks about uh, sharing with gentleness and respect. There's a number of reasons, but this would be one of the reasons, I think, because people don't know what they don't know. I mean, it would be like me yelling at a nine-year-old little boy for his not knowing how to do my taxes or yelling at an eight-year-old little girl for not being able to drive my car. They don't know what they don't know. It would be ludicrous for me and height of lunacy for me to think any different. So when they begin to take the first steps to knowledge, what I need to do is treat them gently. Treat them with respect if I hope that they will learn, let alone even want to learn. So I'm going to wrap this up a little bit. Actually, the worship team can come up. But I have a final thought for you as I wrap all of this up together. Here's what I want you to do. There's a lot of stuff that we talked about. I want you to not overthink it. Don't overthink it. In fact, let me tell you why this insight into the meaning of, of this First Peter text this morning has been so exciting and so liberating to me this week. You see, it's become clearer than ever before that the reason we aren't freer or more natural, I'm talking about myself as well as many that I do know within the church, why we're not freer or more natural in sharing about the reality of our hope in Christ is that we don't feel very hopeful ourselves, church. And if our hearts aren't full of hope in the promises of Christ, then here's what happens when the opportunity uh, presents itself to make a case for a hope. We sense then it is more of a duty to debate doctrine, yeah. right? Instead of a delight to tell somebody why we're hopeful. I saw, as I was preparing this this week, like never before, that witnessing will always be a burden as long as Christianity means for us simply keeping a certain list of do's and don'ts. Here's my boundaries. This is what Christianity is all about. So many people in the church have simply inherited the motions of, of church life and, and, and showing an outward morality and religiosity. But the joyful hope in Jesus' promises are foreign to their experiences. We kind of talked a little bit about that last week, remember? When you see the look in some people's faces, they do not, they, they betray their heart focus being on self and on the world as opposed to on Jesus Christ. Where's your heart focus? What does your face and your joy betray or lack of joy betray? And so what happens is that people don't feel any hope brimming up within their hearts and yet we should be the ones that overflow with hope. What this means then is that the way to get ready to make a case for your hope, get this, is to get hopeful. This is what was so exciting to me. We don't have to overthink things. Don't, don't spend all your time beforehand thinking and processing about how to answer somebody else's questions. Don't worry about that. Instead, search out the promises of Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah. Meditate on his character. Meditate on his work. And in that way, you're going to discard your own fear. And instead, you're going to kindle your hope. <laughs> you just can't help but do that. This very act of honoring Jesus for ourselves will be the best preparation for making a case for the hope that we have as we present to others. And I got to tell you, that was an exciting and a liberating time for me, church. That means then that our primary activity in preparing to witness isn't to study what books of the Bible come after the next. Yes. It's not studying what, uh, uh, memorizing John 3, 16, and also make sure you get 17 in there too, so you got, you're well-rounded. No, that's not what he's talking about. He says, listen, uh, what we need to be doing to prepare to witness, to give an answer to anyone who asks, is to keep our own hearts happy in God. Amen. Practically, that means we go to the Word day after day, not to anxiously gather arguments for every possible argument somebody might have. No, you go to the Word because we, we are so desperately needy. We go to the Word because our own hope decreases. We go to the Word because we have, I have fears that need to be overcome by the promises of God. In fact, we have doubts, church. I know we do that need to be answered. 
the fight of faith. We're going to be talking about this in September, moving on into the future. And our focus will be prayer. That will be our theme over the next year. Calling Vision 2020, getting the vision from God as He speaks into our lives. We're going to be learning what, what that means. And I've got to tell you, I'll give you a little tip now. The fight of faith is waged on our knees with the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer. And when we emerge, church, from that encounter with God, with a renewed and living hope in His promises, we'll be ready to make a case for our hope. Because church, God only calls us to tell others the reasons which that very day are making us hopeful in Christ. Amen. Let's sing some worship songs together and then we'll be dismissed.